grab one of the Bibles that we have here in the church for you. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13, so you know where to turn in your Bibles. He graduated first from his hometown high school. He went away to the university and then on to the medical school and spent more time in residency and fellowship training than he did in his hometown growing up. When he finished all of his training, he decided to move back home and to set up a practice. He was now one of the world's foremost experts in his field. And yet, when the hometown residents came to visit the doctor, they saw him as the boy who couldn't comb his hair when he went to school every day. And I think, sadly, this is our experience, isn't it, with some of the medical profession that we know, even in our own town. And our thoughts are sometimes verbalized when we meet them in the office. I remember you when you, when you couldn't even tie your shoes. And the doctor's thoughts are also verbalized. Mr. Kohler, I want you to count from 1 to 10 backward. 10, 9, 8, and now your life is in my hometown hands. If some of the most highly trained medical professionals in the world receive a lackluster welcome when they come home, what would it have been like for Jesus, God and man, to return to his hometown. You see, up until this time in Mark's gospel, Jesus has displayed his lordship over nature, over demons, over death. The results of his miracles is that the crowds were amazed by his power. And yet when Jesus goes to his, to his hometown, Nazareth, they are underwhelmed. And instead, it is Jesus that is amazed at their lack of faith. Friends, Jesus offends this world. He does. I was meeting with our small group a couple of weeks back, and we were talking about this fact, and I told them, I said, you know, sometimes you get in those situations where people are just mad at you because you're a Christian. Tell them, I'm not your problem. Jesus is your problem. And here's why. Because he's God. And because as God, he himself creates an obligation on your life. You must follow him. Or you can deny him. But there are consequences for both. You see, the world doesn't want to repent of its sins. It doesn't want to repent from its autonomous inclination toward sinfulness. The truth is that the world was a troubling place for Jesus. And guess what? It will be a troubling place for his disciples, his followers as well. Jesus is offensive to those who do not believe. I want to divide our text roughly in half today. We're going to look at verses 1 through the beginning of verse 6. We're going to look at Jesus' encounter with unbelief. And then the second half of verse 6 through verse 13... We'll look at the disciples' encounter with unbelief. Read with me verses 1 through the beginning of verse 6. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done By his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus has left the region of Capernaum, the north side of the Sea of Galilee. He's gone into the southern hill country now to his hometown, Nazareth. 
Jesus is not traveling alone. His disciples are with him. When Jesus eventually is rejected, we're going to find out his disciples are rejected as well. You might recall John chapter 15, Jesus gave them a little bit of heads up warning about this. He said, remember the words that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they're going to persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will keep yours. But all of these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. Mark's gospel focuses on Jesus being son of God in power. He focuses on the miracles that Jesus accomplishes that proves that he is the son of God. And all along the way, the disciples are following after Jesus. This is their boot camp, their training for ministry. When the disciples enter into their ministry, what they find out is that they will receive the same type of either welcome or rejection that Jesus received. Verses 1 through 3, Jesus is in the synagogue, and it's Sabbath. It's interesting to me that every time Jesus goes into the Sabbath in Mark's gospel, you know what he encounters? Opposition. Every time. Shouldn't be like this, though. The synagogue was the place where the Jews would gather, they would read God's word, they would pray. The synagogue was designed to be a reprieve from the hostile world. This is where we go and we learn about God. And we say to ourselves, the Lord is God, no matter what the world says around us. But when Jesus goes to the synagogue, he finds hostility. His first experience in the synagogue in Mark's gospel, he encountered a man with a demon. How ironic. He'll next confront the religious elite. That's what we're reading about today. The synagogue, unfortunately, can be a hostile place. At first, the people were amazed at his power, at his ability to perform miracles. But Jesus, unfortunately, is an outsider in a movement that is well-established by the insiders. You see, Jesus is a teacher. He's a preacher. In the ancient world at that time, in order to engage in the teaching business, you had to go to school to do that. And the school of the teacher, of the rabbi, was to be trained by another rabbi, a very famous rabbi. The more famous the name of the rabbi that you're connected with, the more clout that you have when you teach. This is a lot like the Ivy League, isn't it? You, know, you go to an Ivy League school and then you can pronounce the name. I went to, and fill in the blank, Princeton or Yale or Harvard or whatever it might be. And just the name of the school today should give you, well, it doesn't, does it? The name of the school today kind of makes me go, ooh. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Jesus is offensive to the power brokers of his day. And yet he teaches and he performs miracles and he baffles them. Notice what they say in verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? In Jewish culture, carpentry and manual labor was not a demeaning job. Jesus is more than willing to work with his hands. He's more than willing to sweat. Paul, is, as well, he was a tent maker. And many of the times when he would travel around and engage in missions, he would build tents, earn some money, travel, and preach. I like that model. He works with his hands. He's a workman worthy of his wage. The Jews didn't look down on that. However, in Roman culture, they did look down on carpentry. In their culture... Carpentry was not a degree that garnered respect. Notice Jesus is called Son of Mary. Could be two reasons for this. Maybe his stepfather, Joseph, died at a very young age. But more probably, this is a demeaning way of referring 
to Jesus. This is a way in which one would refer to a person when they're questioning the legitimacy of their birth. It's ironic to me, do you know the way that that, uh, Muslims, uh, the way that they think about Jesus is similar to this. Son of Mary, they would say. Islam argues that Jesus is the product of a consort between God and Mary. Kind of like Zeus, you know, in the ancient world. Zeus frolics around with ladies and his offspring are like Hercules and things like that. The Bible doesn't say this about Jesus, though. Jesus is from the Holy Spirit. God is the origin of the God-man, not really even Mary. The end of verse 3, the crowds are offended by Jesus. Christianity is often offensive to those who have studied in the most prestigious schools in this world. Now, there are, I think, some bright exceptions to this rule, but generally speaking, if you've gone to the best universities and colleges, you're going to find out those institutions are also God-hating institutions, and that is true today. To me, the Ivy League holds zero clout. Why? Because it is in those institutions where they claim there is no God. Once spoke with a person who had gone to an Ivy League school. Conversation was very short. Person managed to mention the name of the school that they went to in about the first five seconds. Well, you know that I went to Cornell. Didn't know that. I'm glad you told me. I'm not going to listen much to whatever you have to say now. Thank you. Jesus encountered opposition like this. He encountered unbelief. Matthew's gospel, Matthew 11, tells us what Jesus did with this unbelief. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise, there's your your Ivy League folk, and understanding, and revealed them to little children. In other words, opposition to Jesus doesn't get him down. It actually accomplishes God's mission. Jesus responds now in verses 4 through 6. Let's read it again. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. He could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he, Jesus, marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus' response, not shocked. A prophet is without honor among his hometown. You see, part of the experience of the Old Testament prophets was a rejection by Israel of their preaching, of their teaching. And Jesus is receiving that exact same welcome. Friends, familiarity with the gospel sometimes breeds contempt for the gospel. Gary spoke with us about the founding of our country. In our own country, this was a land that was saturated with gospel. When the Puritans came and they began to establish our country, they did it on Christian values, Christian principles. Freedom of religion was not freedom from religion for them. It was freedom to worship God apart from the demeaning control of the crown over their practice. There's much preaching in our land, but what's happened in this land? But we've drifted further and further away from our God. The same way being in church every Sunday, listening to the gospel week in and week out, I would say, that's dangerous. It's dangerous because this gospel is either going to soften your heart or it will harden you if you do not believe. It's important to inspect the condition of your heart as you hear the gospel. Verse 5 to 6 tells us Jesus didn't do many miracles there. Now, the text says that he could not do a mighty work there. And it goes on to say, except that he 
did a couple of miracles. He healed some sick people. Now, many people would kind of hang on to that one phrase, he could not, and camp out, I think, too long there. And they would say, ah, ha, ha, look at this. There's something Jesus can't do. I'd say the point there is that miracles would not produce faith in his hometown. Why does Jesus perform miracles? He's not trying to entertain people. He's not just pulling rabbits out of the hat and saying, oh, look at this one. Isn't it fluffy? And poof, it's gone. I can do more. You know, just what? No. He does them because he wants people to believe. If their hearts are hard, no matter what miracles he does, it's not going to matter that much. In Mark's gospel, this is the last time that Jesus visits Nazareth. They don't believe. They've rejected Jesus. And he moves on. The mission of Jesus was never intended to be accomplished alone. Jesus was not a lone ranger on a lone ranger mission. He was discipling others in order that they might also preach and teach. And this is the second movement of our text. Jesus encounters unbelief. Guess what his followers are going to experience? Unbelief as well. Read with me the second half of verse 6, and let's go down to verse 13. And he went among the villages teaching, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and then will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. You notice Jesus' ministry in verse 6 is labeled a teaching ministry. Second half of verse 6, he's going around teaching the gospel in many villages. It's important to point that out because the disciples' ministry as well should be a teaching ministry. Have you ever heard this critique, maybe from a friend? They'll say, yeah, you know, I'm not sure that I want to go to your church. Why is that? He doesn't really preach. He just teaches. You say, well, what's the difference between preaching and teaching? Maybe you've never heard real preaching. Otherwise, you might understand the basis of teaching in it. You see, it's not a, enough for a preacher just to entertain you, tell you some stories. This one I'm going to make you laugh with. This one's designed to make you cry. This one's designed to make you think of your golden retriever, you know? And now leave with some sort of moral. No, no, no. The point of preaching is to teach you systematically the Scriptures. Jesus taught. I intend to teach. Disciples go out with the authority of Christ. They do not represent themselves. They represent Jesus. One of my favorite former teachers used to say this, give them God, get out of the way. Very simple mission. The disciples are also sent with the authority of Christ. They're going to do some of the same things that he did. And they're proving that the messianic reign of God has begun in Jesus. Proclamation of the gospel goes hand in hand with God's mighty works, with God changing lives. Next, Jesus tells them, this is how you're to go about your business. Verses 8 and 9, he tells them what to take and what not to take with them. Their ministry, their lifestyle is to be a simple ministry. Simple lifestyle, proclaiming a simple gospel. Jesus tells them, just take the minimum with you. 
Just the necessities. You, you don't need two tunics. You just need one. Travel light, travel fast, and preach. Now, isn't it strange that when we get a lot of things around us, it can bog us down, can't us? It, it, it can distract us from the main thing. We start looking at all these other little things around us. You see, this world can be a burden and a barrier to our calling to share the gospel with those that are around us. Jesus wants his followers just focus on the bare essential, not all of the peripheral, and rely on Christ and the provision that his spirit brings. They are to trust not their supplies, not their schooling, but their God. The mission of the twelve is a mission of faith. Go out and trust that when you share the gospel with others, God is working and God will change lives. Now, I also think it's important here that they're sent out by twos. In the Old Testament, two witnesses were necessary in a legal case to prove the legitimacy of that case. Two witnesses made it an authentic testimony. Friends, God doesn't send you out alone either. Going in pairs provides disciples with the mutual encouragement that we need. And we began by saying that Jesus didn't go out on a Lone Ranger ministry, Lone Ranger mission. I would say, when He sends you out, share the gospel. He doesn't send you out alone either. If you're married, you've got a partner right there in your own house. Go with your husband, go with your wife. If you're not married, I'd say, you don't have to look around very far to find someone with equal interest in the gospel. Go with them. I remember what it was like to be single, you know, back in the college and uh, graduate school days. And to think, you know, Lord, just, just give me a marriage partner. And then I'll be, you're ready. Often we look too long, too hard for that special someone. Instead of just looking for who's right there around us, go with them. Sharing the gospel can be encouraging and discouraging. You ever had those opportunities? Maybe you, you know, knock on the door of your neighbor and, and, and you uh, tell them, hey, you want to come to church? We have fifth Sunday. Brunch today. You can eat as well. And they say something like this, I will never step foot in that church. Why not? Is it the food? No, 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 no. It's Jesus. <laughs> That's discouraging, isn't it? It can be. We all need to be encouraged. Keep sharing the gospel. Keep telling your friends about Christ. Going with somebody else helps in that. He tells them as well, when you go, this is how you are to act. Verses 10 and 11. Accept the, hosp the hospitality that's offered to you. Be content with the home, with the lodging that you are given. How many preachers have you seen that are not content with the lodging that they're given? Not content with the um, wheels that they're supposed to drive around? Always looking around for the bigger and better. Jesus tells his followers, life should be simple, not complex. Be grateful for what you have. Several years ago, a group of pastors in a town pooled their resources. They were going to collectively make a common pot and then make a phone call to a very famous preacher to come and preach. Now, this particular preacher, his um, honorarium was pretty steep. And so it took about five or six churches to gather enough money to make the honorarium. And they call the preacher and they say, hey, can we schedule you to come and preach in our town? He said, yeah, you know, I'm kind of booked up for the next two years. That's fine. Two years out's great. Just, you know, come and preach. So they get to the point where he's 
going to be coming to their town, and they pool their resources again to get a hotel, the nicest hotel they could find in their city. Preacher comes in town, and he asks them, so where am I staying? And they tell him, well, you know, it's a holiday inn. He says, not nice enough. I stay in truly exquisite hotels. So he books his own ho hotel, and he says, so uh, what have you got for me for dinner tonight? And they said, well, you know, we, we're going to uh, take you to the nicest restaurant that we know of. And he said, and, and what would I eat there? And they tell him, and he says, ha, <laughs> let me give you a menu of what I typically eat. What type of beverages were you going to serve me? And they told him, and he says, well, there's a particular brand of water that I like, and I like it not cold but chilled. I'd like that to be on hand. By the time that this preacher made it to the pulpit and preached, guess what happened? No one would listen to him. Why? Because he has an air of arrogance about him. He had all these expectations about how important that he was. Nobody wanted to hear the message that he spoke. You see, we can be offensive at times as well. When we're not focused on that simple life and that simple gospel. There were towns that would not accept Jesus' followers. Jesus told them, this is what you're supposed to do when they don't accept you. Shake the dust off your feet as a testimony of their unbelief and leave. Jews in the ancient world, when they would travel outside of Israel and they would come home, do you know what they would do as soon as they crossed that boundary line from Gentile territory into the Holy Land? They would sit down on the ground, take their shoes off, and, you know, rub them together in that Gentile territory, they'd step in the Holy Land. If the village does not receive the message of Christ, then that town is polluted, it's unclean. Now, I think the, the mission is summarized of the 12 in verses 12 and 13. Their preaching should produce Repentance. If we are truly focused on the gospel, it does something to our hearts. It, it, it exposes those areas in our lives that, that are dark areas that we don't want to tell anybody about. It breaks our heart. It causes us to fall in front of the cross and say, Lord, as the song already said, I need you. Oh, I need you. Now, there are common elements to Christianity in verses 12 and 13, and there's one element that stands out to me, not mentioned very often. The common elements, preaching, repentance, Mark's gospel, casting out demons. It's all over the place in that gospel. Healing disease and sicknesses. There's one thing, though, that only occurs twice in the New Testament, and that is anointing with oil. We see it here, Mark 6. In verse 13, and we see it as well in James 5, verse 14. What's the point of that? Maybe you've been around some that they really believe in the anointing of oil. And, and, and so when they, whatever they're going to get themselves into, if it's purchase of a car, I'm going to bring some motor oil with me. And the, the, <laughs> the uh, mechanic is going to tell you, well, you should oil it. <laughs> I can't even say it. You know, it's bad when you laugh at your own jokes and nobody else does. <laughs> You're supposed to unscrew the cap when you anoint it with oil, not, you know, the doors and everything else. Or maybe you purchase a house, you know, and it's okay, we're going to get some olive oil, and we're going to go around and just dab a little bit on every doorknob. What's the deal with the anointing of oil here? Oil in the ancient world was sometimes used as a medicine. And so I think what's happening is this is a way of singling out individuals in order for God's special care on their life. In other words, there's nothing magical about the oil. Now, do you need oil in a car? Absolutely. But beyond that, you know, oil is not magical. It's the gospel that heals, not anointing oil. Well, let's summarize. Jesus' ministry faced opposition. If you believe in Christ, you will face opposition as well. 
The ministry of Christ was about preaching the good news. Gospel. It's about repentance. It's about encountering the forces of evil in this world. Friends, you will face the forces of evil as well. Call it for what it is and share the good news. So what do we expect when we go out of this room and speak to others about God's grace? We can expect the same opposition that Christ faced. But we can also minister with joy. Why? Because in the end, Christ and his kingdom is triumphant. Not the devil and his demons. Please stand. Let's sing.